Good afternoon, everyone. I am Natos Pozvatas. I'm the scientific director for the Institute for Applied Computational Science. Uh, before I start uh, with the seminar to the speaker, I would like to first make an announcement. Uh, this is the last talk seminar of this uh, semester for the spring. We will be check the website. Also, I would like to invite everyone to the ICS, the Institute for Applied Computational Science, for the showcase in May 8th at 5 p.m. at Peter's Hall. This is where the students from the Institute will be showcasing their project for the semester. There are about 20 projects from adversarial networks to simple uh, playlist generation for Spotify. So that's on Peter's 301, uh, May 8th at 5 p.m. So uh, today's seminar is called, hosted by the Institute <coughs> initially for Data Science. Data Science Initiative, right? Uh, and um, we have the co-director here for the part. Uh, so uh, it's my honor to introduce the speaker today, Ben Schneiderman, who is a distinguished professor at the University of Maryland, computer science, but also a founding director of the computer uh, uh, human interaction lab. <laughs> Uh, he received his PhD from Sunny uh, Stoney Group, and he's considered a pioneer in uh, computer, human computer interaction with information uh, visualization. Uh, his talk today will summarize 10 years of research in uh, analyzing or visualizing healthcare data in the sense of time series. <laughs> well, I'm, me, I'm in trouble. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you, Samos. And thank you, Alyssa Goodman, has been my gracious host and for yesterday and today and uh, showing me around campus and introducing me to groups. And it's been a very satisfying experience. Whoa, OK. Uh, all right. So uh, as Samos mentioned, I'm proud to represent this 35-year-old group, Human Computer Interaction Lab at University of Maryland. That's jointly between computer science and the College of Information Studies, or the iSchool, which is a flourishing and growing place, plus partnerships with other groups around campus, including the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, MYTH. Uh, our website has 1,000 technical reports and 200 videos, 200 projects, uh, and lots to take a look at. I hope some of you know me for the book, Designing the User Interface, now in sixth edition. Required five co-authors to tell the story of the remarkable growth of human-computer interaction and the why it is that two or three billion people have something like this in their pockets that they can actually use to be in touch with their family, get health information, uh, do business, uh, uh, and, and, and be in touch with family and friends. So that's, that's kind of the story overall, but I've sort of known for a few things, like the words are highlighted on the screen, and you click on them, the light blue words. This is the Wikipedia article on Harvard, and if you click on them, you go somewhere else. That work was ours in 1985, uh, and that's traveled very well. It's kind of satisfying. Tim Berners-Lee had seen a project we had done with that and put it in. We called them embedded menus. He was smart enough to call them hotspots. So sometimes the name matters. We also did the little keyboards where you put your finger and you can slide it back and forth and then activate on liftoff. That's what's still on the uh, Apple iPhone. And, and that idea made it possible to point at very small items on a screen. The, the reviewers of the paper did not believe that we could point to such small targets. And producing the video uh, at that time was, took a little effort, uh, but enabled us to convince the, uh, the reviewers. Also, things like photo tagging were all dependent on the idea of visual representation of the world of action, that you can drag labels and stick them on the screen and then search by those kind of things. We've also done a lot of the visualization work. Spotfire is a successful commercial product, which presented the idea of multiple coordinated windows, dynamic query sliders, where you could use these double box sliders to rapidly, incrementally move, and then all five windows would update simultaneously to uh, show the impact of those changes. Um, we could look at the stock market. This shows the Standard & Poor's 500, all the stocks in the S&P, organizing industry groups such as technology, financial, um, 
services and consumer goods. The area indicates the market capitalization, and Apple's the biggest, but Google, Facebook, uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, Exxon Mobile are not too far behind. We also worked on network visualization, the free download for Node XL. Um, is still out there, and today my focus is about the most recent effort called Event Flow, which was focused on looking at electronic medical records. So, just a few again, the principles to make sure you follow that you have these sliders that you can move, and then these will all update. This is a rare case of a single screen getting a published paper. This was Nick Thomas, a British researcher, who found the unexpected high activation of the RBP2 gene, uh, and it's shown here, highlighted over here, as well as in the plate view. And that simple result was significant enough. It's rare that you get it out of one screen, uh, but uh, it, it uh, usually takes a good deal more. So maybe you just flash through that, and sometimes you need 27 windows to understand higher dimensional data sets. And that's the kind of explorations that people are doing. And I've been an advocate, as some of you know, for visual information uh, presentation in orderly ways. And these are some of the environments that work. So for a radiologist, seeing uh, 12 views of a brain scan this week and last week side by side enables them to see changes without scrolling and moving and clicking and jumping. They concentrate on it and they can see the distinctions and the features that they're looking for. The Bloomberg terminal for stock traders, uh, bond traders, 300,000 people pay $20,000 a month to have that on their desktop. So that kind of you know, uh, uh, organized, synchronized um, window displays with, uh, that presents the information they need is valuable enough to warrant that kind of use. My own workstation is two 8 megapixel displays so that I can see, actually on one screen, I can see 15 pages of a paper I'm working on. I see the reviewer's comments on the other screen. I can make the changes, move a whole section or a, a graphic around. Well, what, was, what, what, was, what struck you as funny? It just, you were smiling? It's quite a bit, yes. Yeah. So in, in a way, I mean, uh, the, the argument is that your productivity or creativity is linearly a function of the number of pixels on your display. Okay, so that, you know, it's worth getting more display. And then, of course, using it in a good way. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, email and Twitter and Facebook and other things popping up, that's not going to work. But if you, the, all the information you need to accomplish your task is on the screen at once and you don't have to scroll and move back and forth, then it, it works. So I actually go to my office for certain tasks that I want to do. Another obvious one is editing photos. I'm a you know, pretty serious photographer. And if I can look at 200 photos at once and select among them and create a story out of that, it's much more effective than having to scroll through one at a time. So think about the tasks you do and how you could improve your productivity by having fewer clicks. There's strong and repeated results from us and others that show the number of clicks, you know, the productivity is inversely proportional to the number of clicks you make. If you have to make a lot of clicks, your productivity and your creativity goes down. And of course, there are, you know, growing applications of many people working together with lots of data for important decisions in real-time situations. Okay, there's also the, the, the pocket-based versions of visualization. I guess my most important visualization doesn't have to be huge, but when I leave College Park at the end of the day and I go to my home in Bethesda, nine miles across, what I'm looking for is the 15 red pixels on the beltway that tell me I should take a different route. So if your design is good, it can focus on very specific tasks, and there, that's the tasks I need. need I need, that's what I get, and I can tell with, you know, within 400 milliseconds if I need to take a different uh, path or not. Um, there's another application of tree maps on an iPhone to show all the jobs in the US, about 12% government, 11% uh, goods, and much of the economy is services. The largest sector there 
our uh, leisure and hospitality is this rectangle over here. So the satisfaction for me is seeing these visual approaches to presenting large of amounts of information being put productively to work. Now one day I wrote down some rules, and this was sort of a playful one, and it appeared in the paper just like this, uh, just repeated as a figure. Uh, and I, I wrote this down for myself and my group to remind myself of this principle. And the principle was that show an overview first. Even if you have a million or a billion points, show the whole data set at once. And then zoom in on what you want, filter out what you don't want, and click for details on demand. And this was in an obscure, not obscure, but I would say a second or even third rate conference as a keynote talk. And that uh, conference paper now has almost 5,000 citations, which is totally astonishing to me. Uh, and when I talk to people, it's, they like it because it gave them a way to think about design. And it shifted from the older interfaces that were SQL, stats, or even spreadsheets, where you saw a limited amount of data, you had to do a lot of things, and you got a result in a very narrow, limited way. But going visual turned out to be productive. Now, of course, there are people who complain about it, who have written jokes about it, who have said you should go the opposite way, and all those things are true, that sometimes the alternate view is, is uh, valuable as well. But I think what people liked here was it asserted the centrality of human decision making. That overview was for the human to see what was going on, to see the clusters and the gaps and the outliers and the distributions. And to be able to see all of it at once without a lot of scrolling and clicking, to be able to concentrate and look at it was important. And then to judiciously zoom in on what they want and filter out what they don't want. So for me, a visualization is not just the display, but it's the control panel that goes with it. Okay? Just like a car has an engine to drive it and it's got a steering wheel to make it go. You need to have the right steering wheel or it's just not very valuable. And there are lots of tools that will generate statistics or bar charts or uh, you know, other kind of nice visual displays. But for me, the control panel is the thing. Okay, so we're going to take a look at that a little more. And these principles have been applied fruitfully for 50 years in the world of scientific visualization, uh, where mainly 3D and 2D visualizations, maps, geographic information systems are probably the most successful uh, visual application, medical visualizations, and a lot of scientific data also does it, and astronomy data, right? I was this morning at the what is it, astrophysics uh, group? Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, where there's huge volumes of data in the worldwide a telescope and that you can explore in three-dimensional ways and even higher dimensions than that. But the new kid on the block for the last 20 years is multivariate, not multidimensional, but multivariate data. And our work on Spotfire was a commercial success, but Tableau is a bigger commercial success. It's a $6 billion company and very widely used. And there are many others. I'm pleased to see on, on the evening news is even advertisements for companies that do this, like Domo, that are you know, promoting these visual tools. And I see them popping up in financial ads. And it's just fun to see your work, your, like tree maps, show up on, on, on television shows and crime shows and so on. So it's fun. Uh, temporal data. Uh, we'll look at a certain kind of temporal data, but there's a lot of that. Tree structure data, which is what tree maps are all about. Network data is another uh, effort. I mentioned our work on Node Excel. Gephi is widely used as well, and commercial tools, and then text visualization and analysis. If you want to learn more about this area, there's some wonderful blogs and um, groups. Flowing data is probably, probably my favorite as the viz of the day and other kind of things. There's other visualcomplexity.com, eager eyes, Robert Kosara. There's a lot of wonderful places if you want to learn more about the world of info viz. OK. Today, I want to focus on temporal data. I mean, I want to make an important distinction between numerical events and categorical events. Now, time series is a well studied area, and there's lots of commercial tools for showing a timeline of stock market data, of economic data, 
Uh, historically, William Playfair in 1742 was the first to use, to develop these widely used, you know, line charts that show economic data over time. And that remains an important uh, notion. But today I'm going to ask you to shift your attention to a slightly different kind of data that we call categorical data with a time stamp on it. So you might arrive at the emergency room, at the hospital, go to the emergency room in a few seconds or a few minutes later, get sent to the intensive care unit, and then an hour later get sent to the floor, and maybe two hours later you exit or two days later. So those kind of time stamps with events tied to them is what we're talking about, and we call them categorical event data. Now, we've been working on this for a while, and so I'm going to take you through a little tour of the history and argue for it, and then do a demo uh, through a video to show you how we've implemented it. So this began when we wanted to work on a single patient history, and this was an early project with my dear colleague, Catherine Plaisant, to show the doctor visits, the hospitalizations, the medical tests, and the medications. And this gives you an overview. Uh, in this case, you're looking at a three-year history, but the design goal was a 100-year patient history with 10,000 medical events. Okay? So the line for today is this gray line. This patient has been pregnant and is forecast to be pregnant two more months, been diagnosed fatigue, diabetes, the blood test, if you click on them, you'll get to see them. Pap smear sonogram, you click on them, there's the fetus. And this patient's been getting insulin, increased dosage of insulin, and I'm told Lasalex counteracts the side effect of that larger dose of insulin. So this kind of one screen visual representation was attractive to some physicians. Rather than looking at 60 or even 100 pages of textual data, and when you wanted to look and see, for example, has this patient had a pap smear regularly? Well, you can see it right here. This is a compliant patient, has had a pap smear every year. The red mark indicates that year that was an abnormal pap smear, but redid it and it was okay. okay. So you get a lot out of this. However, there's something that will leap out to you once you come to know this data, once your eye and your mind is trained had an abnormal mammogram, had a redo that was normal and a redo that was normal, but did not return after that. So this gap is sort of a screaming gap that stands out to anyone who knows that they expect to see a regular mammogram. Now, we don't know what happened. Maybe this patient went to another hospital and to do that. Maybe they didn't have mammograms. Maybe they actually had a mastectomy and didn't need to do them anymore. So we don't know. And a visualization doesn't tell you everything, but it does invite you to ask questions in a much more compelling way, we think, than textual lists. I know that when I get, uh, I just was at my, my annual physical and I got a blood test and there's three pages. <laughs> uh, and I'm scanning through this thing to try to make sense of it. And then I'm trying to remember how was it last time? Was, is my cholesterol lower or higher than last year, or two years, or three years ago? To be able to see all that at once is pretty tough in current medical systems. And so by combining it all, and every one of these is a kind of giant menu. If you click on this, you get the text of the pap smear, and all of these things pop up, uh, in this case, in a single window. This was an older design, but by now you could pop up multiple of these, see them side by side if you have enough display. Okay? This idea has been picked up by many, and many medical systems have something like this. Uh, currently, the, the uh, British uh, National Health Service is considering adopting nationwide the, the implementation done at University of Southampton by Dr. David Rue, who's built a version based on this. He had his own variations and changes that fit what he thought was right. But the idea of a single screen to see it all uh, was uh, uh, you know, an important one. Well, one patient is great. But of course, we want to see a dozen, a hundred, a thousand, a million patients. And so we began down this road. And Lifelines 2, the natural name 
uh, was the system was built by David Wang. Where's David? David's here. There he is. David was a PhD student, worked with us. This is his work. He's now eight years been here at Partners Healthcare and continuing to work on uh, versions of this system. And this was a story where each stripe is now one patient and we're focused on one aspect. So these were radiology contrast injections and we see all the patients and we align them, we align them by the time of the radiology contrast. So they're all lined up there. And the question is, with the creatinine levels before they had they, their contrast injection, was it high or was it normal? And then afterwards, look at all these high ones or these were normal. So with a glance, if you're interested as a clinical researcher to understand the general patterns or find those who had abnormalities, you can do it with this system. And this was a good step forward. You can see this. 3,600 patients that we're viewing in here. Well, we're only seeing a half dozen of them or five of them over here. We have a little bit of a summary uh, and we were encouraged by this uh, and there's a control panel over here. But I want to move on to the really current state and what we think is a really big breakthrough, which is the life flow visualization that allows you to see not just six or 600, or, but six or 60,000. So here we're looking at patient histories. Very simple, blue for arriving at the hospital. I guess that's purple for emergency, intensive care unit, green for the floor, black for dye, and blue for discharge. And you can read this, this is 90 patients. And you can see that the largest group of 20 six patients, they arrived at the hospital, they went to the emergency room, and they were discharged within a few hours. So time moves this way, and that's the average time for all 26. Now, the next common pattern, you can see the tree structure we're building at. They arrive at the hospital, they go to the emergency room, and they're sent to the intensive care unit. And of those, after, on average, four days, they get sent to the floor in the hospital. And then, on average, after 11 days, they're discharged. Okay, so nice overview. Some of them, and this is something hospitals worry about, they go to, the, they go to intensive care, they go to the floor, and they bounce back to the intensive care. That's a problem. What went wrong? How come they didn't track that and catch it? But, some of them are, survive and do okay, and others take longer, and this one's almost 28 days until they're discharged, and here some actually died while they were in the hospital. Others died while in intensive care, others went to the floor and then to intensive care, and then they died. And so you can see all these patterns, the different lengths, and you can see here is our troubling patient who bounces back and forth, back and forth over a long period of time. Let me take a breath and just see. Do you understand this? This is the central idea. Okay? All right, and go to the video in a moment. One more slide just to show you. Here, and now we're looking at 7,000 patients. And so you can begin to see how this is gonna scale even to hundreds of thousands or more patients. And now you can see the distribution line for the amount of time and this very long tail for how long it takes for them to get uh, discharged. So here, you know, they go to the hospital, emergency room, and they're discharged within, on average, looks like about 16 hours. Okay? Now, the feature, so I wanted you to understand this novel display which again has the numbers of patients over here, and there are many ways to organize it, but the one you'll see show the most frequent pattern on top, and then the other patterns going down below that one. So I'm gonna stick with this example and show you a five minute video from my dear colleague, Catherine Plaisant, that demonstrates these features interactively. Here we see all uh, uh, uh. the individual records. In this case, and the data is showing how the patient moves through the hospital over time. 
here in the legend, we see all the possible event type found in the data. In this case, it was the arrival at the hospital, going to the emergency room, to the ICU, to the normal floor room, and being discharged alive or not. It is possible to scroll through, in this case, even just a small sample of 100 patients, but it, it makes it very difficult to see any overall pattern. You know, why are people going, how are they moving through the hospital? And that's why we have the overview. Now I could see all the patterns of all the patients in the data set. Let's zoom a little bit. So remember that this is time, and this corresponds to the number of patients in each of the groups. We group all the patients who have the same pattern. So first, I could see that everybody arrives at the hospital, everybody goes to the emergency room. This is how the, this sample was that selected. And out of all those people, about a third are uh, discharged alive. And uh, if I click on this uh, group, I see all the individual records move to the top. So live, emergency, discharge alive. Right? So next, uh, most common thing to happen, apparently, is after going to the emergency room, is going to the ICU. We have this group uh, of patients here. Right? And out of those, about two-thirds go to a normal floor room. And out of those, a half seem to be discharged alive. Well, some people go back to the emer emergency uh, to the ICU. Sorry. All right. We could also see some weird patterns. Here's some patient. If I click on them, I could see them here. They went back and forth and back and forth between the emergency room and the floor. Then, and it always happened. We also see some weird patterns. Those patients died first before going to the ICU. <laughs> Probably some data entry problem or. Some people suggested maybe an uh, organ transfer case. But anyway, it always happens. There is always un unexpected things in the data. I could zoom further. I could also put the distribution. Uh, remember that we see typically, you know, by default, we see the average time between events. But if I put my cursor, I will get the distribution. Users often also want to search for specific patterns. One way to do this is with the advanced search. Let's say, for example, I want to find patient that went to the ICU, then went to a normal floor room, but bounced back to the ICU. So I could search. I could see the, the record that match, so that do not match. And it's very important to look at them, because very often you need to adjust your query. For example, here I could see that this patient went back to the ICU you know, more than a month later, so it doesn't count as a bounce back. We want that to happen quickly, so I could add a constraint. So here I might say that I want the ICU to uh, be within two days of the normal floor room. I have the constraint, save, and check that it's correct, and search again. Now I'm finding people who bounce back to the to the ICU. I could also write them to the selection, see where they found where they where they are in the overview, and I might save those records for further study. Note that you could also search for events that do not occur. So for example, this one I could say not occur. And it will now it's uh, appear in the do not occur zone. So you could see people who went for, to the ICU within two days, but it was the first time they had never been to the ICU before. And I search. Another important thing for this short demo, being able to control the alignment. Let's say you want to know what happened before and after the first ICU. The overview is recalculated. Now we see a space here in the middle. And on the left is what happened before the first ICU. On the right is what happened after. Of course, you might choose to see only what happened after. And we could see here, like, uh, 
the most common pattern is after going to the ICU is uh, discharge dead, unfortunately, in this little sample. Uh, but you also see here on the right that uh, all the individual records were aligned by that first ICU. Oh, okay. So the idea, I hope you get it, and the idea of overview and then the details and the control panel to allow you to zoom in on the ones you want. And we're very proud of that search capability because those queries are extremely difficult to specify in SQL or any other method that people have tried uh, because basically the data set is a, a, a narrow and tall set of data which has patient ID, event, and timestamp. That's it, a long, deep one. But so you need multiple joins to be able to find out about a particular patient or a sequence of events. Those are cumbersome, difficult to specify, and also difficult, slow in executing. So event flow is built on a very specialized set of data structures, uh, and, and that gives it some of its power. Uh, David uh, Wang published a wonderful paper about the algorithm for doing that that was faster than any of the other algorithms that did similar kind of work. So the point is the visualization work drives us further in terms of algorithms and in terms of design. These new features, the graphic interface for specifying queries, all were steps forward. All of them just the beginning of what really needs to be done. Uh, what many people want is a much larger and scalable version, so a relational database back end, and then ways to execute the queries in optimized way at scalable size databases. The other thing is the specification of queries. While we have the notions of relational completeness, I suspect some of you theory people might come up with notion of event completeness. That is, what are all the kind of things that you want to be able to ask that are possible to, possible to ask? Just sort of one more example, just to show you the ways this has been put to work. We have 50 or 60 groups that have used it. Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. came to us with a question about their pediatric trauma bay, okay? So uh, infants or two-year-olds are brought in, and the protocol requires that they check the airway, breathing, circulation and disability, A, B, C, D, all within two minutes. And then seven minutes for the secondary survey. Take off all the clothes, check for burns, rashes, cuts, anything else, bleeding, whatever, and you get seven minutes to do that. And the question that uh, the hospital manager asked us was, how well does our team do in getting this done right? So they actually installed a video camera and they videotaped these things, and then someone by hand coded them. They've now moved on to more automatic ways of capturing this. But what you get then, when you look at the data, and there's about a dozen items, different tasks they've collected, uh, different event types from airways giving them a blanket, whether they uh, got an intravenous or oxygen, and so on. And so you get this kind of a view. This is 214 patients, 215 patients. We call this the confetti view because it's kind of pretty, but again, it's pretty hard to distill. And just to go briefly, what, we were, what you're able to do in really just a few minutes with a bunch of clicks is to simplify the patterns, and then you get this result, which is what they wanted to see. And so only 104 of these patients got the right treatment. Airway, breathing, circulation, and a uh, disability check, and then the seven minutes for the uh, secondary survey. And then 29 forms of error. Now, see if you've been paying attention. What's the most common error? Long sequence. Yeah, what is it? It's this bunch, and this purple, this turquoise line is inside this box, which means the, dis the secondary survey was begun, and then the disability check was done after the secondary survey. Now, I don't know if that's serious in terms of treating patients, but that's what they wanted to know. That's what we had from the data. The other common things are inverted orders. Look at that. For about 30 of the patients, they got their breathing checked first, and then their airway checked. 
again, I don't know if that's serious, but the managers of the hospital expected their staff to do things in a certain way, and they weren't doing that. Other more serious things are leaving out certain checks, uh, and, and uh, those could be problematic, or delaying certain checks. And you can see there's some actually where the secondary survey took as many as it, it goes off the screen, but 30 minutes. So all those violations popped up. And again, it's another, to me, celebration of the power of visual display. Because without this visual display, I would not even know what kind of SQL queries to write. OK? And they're pretty tough ones to write here. But I wouldn't even know what to write. I wouldn't know what 29 to write for. There's a, there's a, you know, a large number of ways that failures might occur, and yet, once your eye and mind are trained, you can read out the failures one after another and see the relative significance. Let me pause again. Any questions? Do you get this here? Most frequent here. This is the most frequent problem. These are other problems that happen here. You can see in this case, the circulation and the disability check were done after the start of the secondary survey. So yeah, and, and they've redone this by way with a larger scale. Yeah, thank you. What about HIPAA? What about it? Is it compliant? Is this tool compliant? Yes. Well, this is a tool we see not for patients, but we see for hospital quality managers and clinical researchers. So they're allowed to see the data. Now, in this particular case, the data was anonymized so we could see it. But we've worked, for example, the US Army Pharmacovigilance Center, which has 15 million patient histories of service people and their families. We never get to see the data, OK? They keep it behind their firewall in the Pentagon. But they use our tools, OK? So we train them to use our tools. We show them the methods. Sometimes they've actually given us a small anonymized sample of 100 patients. Actually, I talk about it was a study of asthma medications. We never get to see the data. We've never, we've never taken patient data at the University of Maryland. We always work it by anonymized sample, so we don't have the HIPAA problems. And then we give the tools to the users. Sometimes we've actually published papers with our medical partners, although we've never seen the data. All right? And they will tell us that they found 37% you know, patients. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of those. Uh, this was another wonderful success story by others. Carolyn Beer is a researcher at CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. She was studying Giardia. Anybody know about Giardia? Yes! <laughs> Giardia is caused by a? By uh, Amila. Drinking, drinking water. Drinking water. But what is in the drinking water? Parasite? Is it a bacteria? That's, it's not a bacteria. It's a parasite. Now, most doctors even don't know that. And that was the concern. So if you go to your doctor and you say, oh, I'm having terrible stomach problems. It's been going on for a week. I'm just really sick and having a terrible time. The doctor gives you antibiotics, which may not do any good and could do some harm. Now, there is a simple lab test that they could administer to determine if it was, anti if it was a, bo a bacteria or, uh, or a parasite. And the question that Carlin Beer and her colleagues had was, how often does this happen? And she collected 3,000 patient histories in the US of the treatment that was done. Actually, she collected 6,000, but half of them, the data was incomplete and not usable enough for study. But of the 3,000 she used, she found only 541 got the right treatment, 19%. She described the jaws dropping as she presented this to her colleagues. And you know, here you can see the, the places where the Giardia test was given, where an antiparasitic was given, and that's the, the correct sequence. But many times, and these were the kind of failures, only an antiparasitic, only a Giardia test, but they didn't get the complete simple sequence that should be carried out. Uh, to her credit, Carlin Beer studied what happened across the southern tier of US states. And there, doctors were more effective because they've seen that kind of problem more often, whereas in the northern parts of the US, the, the, the success rates were even lower. 
Okay? And now there are about six groups at Center for Disease Control that are using event flow for studying other kind of disease trajectories. Uh, we began to work with the University of, of uh, Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore, and it's kind of a satisfying thing as a researcher in visualization that within six weeks of our training them about the tool, they had two published papers, one about metastatic uh, prostate cancer and the other about uh, warfarin usage uh, in patients with traumatic brain injury. So these were modest size. That was about 3,000 patients, right? This was more like 7,000 patients. And I can't even explain to you what went on there, uh, but uh, I just you know, use this as a way of signaling the kind of applications people were doing. Yale Medical School, Seth Pausner had spent his sabbatical with us, and he was studying uh, interpersonal violence within families and the role of drugs or alcohol or drugs and alcohol. And the questions were, does violence lead to alcohol abuse or does alcohol abuse lead to violence? And so they had 142 patient histories over 90 days each. And so they were able to do the study and, and uh, get a better understanding of what the relationship of those are. There's more data in here because there, there are fights, there are police calls, there's sexual abuse, etc. cetera. Um, the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, wanted to study the education histories of their male students in computing versus the female students. So you can see there are a lot more male students than there were female students. And they were wondering whether the women students took longer to, their, their fear was they were taking longer to complete the degree. But they were quite confirmed, those who completed the degree, they graduated, were about the same amount of time for the men and the women. Again, fewer women, but uh, about the same amount of time. And those who transferred to other programs or went into other degrees were about the same between the two groups. So these kind of comparisons are also facilitated uh, by the tools in event flow. And I, I've already mentioned the Army one about, uh, maybe it's worth saying a little bit more. So the 15 million patients database is many petabytes and a kind of difficult thing to work with. And you know, as is our style, we asked them, what's your question? And they said, well, we're interested in the asthma medical treatments, the drugs that are given for asthma. I said, OK. And of those 15 million patients, how many? 335,000, it turned out. That was an easy simplification. And we said, do you need all the data about these patients? Do you need everything? No. We're only interested in the medications they got for an asthma treatment. I said, good. And uh, you have a range of medications? Well, actually, we're interested in the differentiation between the SABAs and the LABAs. Okay, short-acting beta agonists and long-acting beta agonists. The short-acting beta agonists are kind of safe. They're low level of dose. The long-acting have many more side effects. And so you don't want to give that LABA too often. And we said, good. So now we know the medications you want to study. And then we said, what else? And it turned out, after discussing, they were only interested in what happened in the last six years. So that further limited the data set. And we went from you know, 15 million to a much smaller, more manageable, that actually fit within event flow's capabilities. Uh, and so they were able to do this analysis. Now, what they showed us the first time through, they you know, took a sample of the data, and they put it up there. I don't have the slide with me. But the first time they tried it, they found that about 50 patients had gone straight to the LABAs. Their first medication was LABA. The protocol requires, first you give them the short-acting beta agonist. And if it doesn't work, and you give them the larger LABA. And when half, when well, 50 of the patients showed up that the first medication was the LABA, they said, you know, this is nice, but you've got to go work on your program because clearly there's a bug in this thing. <laughs> so we went back for a week, and we returned a week later. And we said, you know, uh, don't think there's a bug in the program. That's really what's there. And they looked at this, and they literally went running out of the room to go grab patient folders to see if this was really the case. And the, the fact that they had not been aware that such a large number of patients had been given 
the substantial dose of the LABA, the long-acting beta agonist, was, was a kind of the shocking revelations. As I say, the, you know, the same thing that happened at Children's Hospital and elsewhere, often people are quite surprised that the real world is a lot messier than they expected, a lot more chaotic, that the adherence to expected protocols is not as good as they think, and these, the, the, this is hidden because the data to this point has not been visible, has not been searchable in a reasonable way. So these are some of the other stories that we could talk about uh, uh, at, at length. Um, and it's been satisfying to see the creative things that people have done with it, like traffic incident management in the Baltimore area. So uh, traffic accident is reported. The police get called, the fire department get called, the ambulance get called. Who arrives first? Who arrives second? How long does it take to clear the patient, then clear the car, and return that highway to normal functioning? And what turned out, there are 16 districts. There was a wide variety in the performance across those districts. And so that led to better understanding and uh, looking at why some districts did so poorly in, in analyzing uh, the recovery from accidents. Um, I would say the data I showed you, the confetti view, happens most of the time when we get started. And we had, over a period of three or four years, developed a set of strategies that uh, did what we called sharpening the analytic focus. There are 14 of them. There's a very nice article that describes how they worked. But for each of these uh, case studies, you can see which of these strategies for shrinking the data set, focusing on the right stuff, uh, eliminating complexity. I mean, sometimes you'd find things we were doing about heart patients. So we were looking to see how many heart attacks someone might have. Okay? And we get to do that, and we see one patient has six heart attacks. Wow, that was pretty shocking. But then we looked at the data, we could see actually there were two heart attacks, but each one was reviewed by three doctors who each gave the diagnosis, and therefore the database showed six. Well, that's an easy one to clean up. I mean, you don't want to leave it that way. What you want is to record only the first diagnosis of a heart attack, and therefore you clean the data and you sharpen the analytic focus. And we found many such things. You, would find a database is quite cluttered with voluminous amounts of data, 100 blood pressure readings that were normal, and then two that go bad. Well, if, you, if your screen is filled with all the normal readings, you don't see the ones that go bad. And so you want to filter out these repeated ones. And one strategy is to turn it into an interval that says normal blood pressure for these six years, and then we get bad blood pressure, high blood pressures over here. So we developed a set of strategies which we think were domain independent, and they're published in this paper, and I think I'll just cruise through that. And just want to describe, and we'll leave time for questions, just a few more of the, the notions. The recent progress is this hierarchical event aggregation, which is embedded in the tool. We came to find that sometimes there were such a profuse variety of event types you saw the examples I showed were simple with six or 10 event types. But real patient histories may have hundreds of event types. In fact, in fact for a, a, a cancer database, there are 400 kinds of lung cancer and 200 kinds of bone cancer. And with that diversity, you can't see anything. But we had a taxonomy that aggregated those. And if you aggregate to the level of lung cancer and blood cancer and, and bone cancer, you will see very dramatically that quite often, did I say, I'm sorry, not lung, blood cancer, uh, uh, breast cancer. Breast cancer often leads to bone cancer, but bone cancer rarely leads to breast cancer. So those kind of observations became really powerful and got us to develop a set of these uh, other, other tools. Um, and another pressure was, or an invitation, for the study of clinical trials. So clinical trials collect lots of data. And usually the protocol for a clinical trial says we're going to run for three years, 
and at the end we'll do a t-test to compare survival rates in treatment A versus treatment B, which is really nice. However, uh, our colleagues, the doctors we talked with said, look, there's a rich amount of data, really carefully collected data over those years. We'd like to study the secondary aspects, like numbers of side effects or other hospitalizations. And we started making a list, and the list grew longer and longer and longer. And we then set out to do what we thought was the ultimate, which was to do every possible test for every possible event between treatment A and treatment B, every possible sequence of events, and every possible change in durations. So in a reasonable data set, you may get a few hundred thousand tests. Now, all of you statisticians will know that's very bad behavior. And no form of Bonferroni corrections will deal with that. But we invoked uh, the good spirits of our hero, John, John Tukey, the exploratory data analysis guy. This book from 1977 is really right on for us. And it said, go for it. Do the 150,000 t-tests. Rank the results by the strength of the, the, the p-value and then use that as an exploratory method. If you find something interesting, then you begin your research on trying to understand if that's really substantive or not. So that was COCO, Cohort Comparison, the PhD work of Sana Malik. And that turned out to be a really nice idea. And while the chemists in the audience will know about high volume uh, you know, uh, testing, we introduced the notion of high volume hypothesis testing, again, breaking many of the rules of statistics. Uh, we think there's lots more to be done to refine the software to add business-related features. What uh, hospital quality control people and insurance agencies want is a report. They don't want to go through all this. They just want a, a report that shows that the hospital is doing fine. It's administering the right treatment. Or the insurance people want to know if uh, uh, they've been excessive in billing for too many things. So there's lots of ways quality control can get done. A back-end database I mentioned was already one of our challenges, scalability, a validation across different usage domains, and then we've been working at building the community. Uh, the University of Maryland now licenses through the Office of Technology Commercialization, and we do give it for free to research groups, so, uh, although they may be changing our rules about that. So the COCO idea was essentially started with two versions or two in invocations of event flow for group A and group B. And while you might make some visual comparisons, it's pretty tough, which is why we leaned on the statistical methods of doing that. Uh, COCO then has a control panel that presents all the results. So the highest p-value difference was for this sequence of events. And then these subsequences were categorized the same way. And then you can see there's also a big uh, and 40% difference for those who had uh, an aspirin. Those who got an aspirin in the emergency room did a lot better, OK? It's not a total surprise, but that was, uh, you know, it did come through in the statistical analysis. The current work is to shift towards prescriptive analytics, OK? So, You'd say, well, if I have all this medical data online, if I have millions of patients, and now I'm a patient, or I'm a researcher, and, or I'm a physician who has a patient, and the question is, should this patient get chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery? Usual kind of choices. Well, I might get some insight if I went to my database of all the, let's say, 40,000 people who had the same kind of cancer, and I saw what happened to them. But you say, wait a minute. Wouldn't I want to choose the people who are like me, same gender, same age, maybe the same history, maybe those who already have had these treatments and now are trying to decide about the next treatment? And so that became the idea of event action. And this is the PhD work of Fandu. Uh, it's the, the example here and the data we had was there are 800 graduate students in the history of University of Maryland in computer science, and we had the data on them, 
And the question, the outcomes they were looking for, either they wanted an academic job or to become an engineer, or they wanted an industrial postdoc, or, or, or to become an assistant professor, okay? So those were the outcomes they wanted. And then the question is, um, did they get there more likely if they took a lot of courses, if they published papers, if they had a summer internship, uh, if they took advanced courses? And so this was semester by semester, the previous history, and then the question is, where do they go for here? And we did that by having an archive of all the students that you could then search. So that avoided some of the HIPAA problems we had in looking, deal with medical data. Uh, we had the student data. Of course, the student data is protected as well, but we worked with the graduate advisors in computer science uh, to do the assessment. Now, one of the parts of this is what does it mean to have patients like me? Here in Boston, the company Patients Like Me is a wonderful success story and does related work in an exceptionally good way. And we developed a sub-tool called Peer Finder. So if you have 40,000 people, how do you know who's like you? And this was for a graduate student. This woman was the target. She wanted to know what to do. And so we looked at only the female students she was concerned with and only the ones going for a PhD. Or she included lightly those who were going for masters but didn't want to have the bachelors or any of the male students included. Okay. So that's kind of a personal choice. Now, we think of this tool as being for consequential life decisions. And we know that people in medical circumstances, they will talk to neighbors or friends and the person said, oh, I had that same thing and I got this treatment. And then the patient will say, I want to have the same thing. And that seems to be, you know, one or two stories are not a good way to make a decision. We thought if we could make consequential decisions based on more informed uh, selection of appropriate peers and then looking at their past trajectories and their future would enable you to make a better prescription. So a little more ambitious version of this one uh, shows, you know, the many here we've got six criteria whether they were international students or not, whether they had work experience or not, whether they were young or old, and you can set the criteria as to what makes someone like me. Again, I just want to stress that this is a kind of way of opening the black box of recommender systems. Uh, we had built a version of this where there was no user interface. It just gave a recommendation. And then we built versions that had some controls and then a, a version which had a lot of controls. And the study we ran with 18 subjects showed that while it took them longer, to use this version with more controls, they were more satisfied with the results. It was harder to use, but they were more invested, and then they were more likely to carry out the recommendations. So we thought that was a, a very strong and powerful result. Now, this idea was supported and picked up by Adobe, which was looking not at, customer, not at uh, patients, but at customer histories. The customer may have gotten a email or some kind of notification, an ad displayed, and then they bought or they didn't buy. And the question is, what kind of sequences lead to, a, to their selling? So these ideas are being put to work at scale in a, in a commercial environment. So that's the story. I know some of you have to go, I see, but just, you know, we've had a nice long history, which is unusual for an academic project to be so mature. Uh, David's work was an early, important contributor. Chris Wongsifasawat went to Twitter from us. Megan Monroe is here at, at uh, uh, Tufts University. Chris Embriano went to work for Apple. Sana Malik's at uh, Adobe Research. Fana, Fan went to Adobe Research. And this project has sort of gone to a certain level of maturity. Uh, and, and we're kind of satisfied. The, the website has a bunch of pictures, has videos. There is a good user manual with 14 one-minute videos that show you how to do it. So if you want to pick up on it and give it a try for your data, we'd love to see that happen and love to see you do it. Thank you for your time and attention. <laughs> oh, I guess I should, and I'll stay for questions, but I should invite you. Our 35th annual symposium will be May 24th uh, in College Park. Come join us. There'll be about 200 people who come to that event. Any questions? Thank you.
Run here, thank you. Yeah, so the scalability is the question, and we've worked on that. The scalability goes in many ways. It's the number of patients, the number of event types, and the number of specific events. So all of those give influence. But I would say our biggest was 203,000 cases, OK? 203,000 cases, medical cases, each with a modest number of events and event types. So it doesn't, you know, getting past that is a lot harder. And that will take a different design of a system. So we think that for an academic specialized tool, it did its job. And I think commercial implementations will have to take the next step. But this is, for a university tool, pretty well done. It's written in Java, so that makes it kind of old fashioned by now. Uh, but it does its job. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Thank you. Interesting. It seems the tool is amazing once you have a good question in mind and the techniques help people sort of drill in and understand the question and the answer better. One of the hardest things nowadays with so much big data is actually figuring out what's the right question to ask. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, I think within the different domains, and I showed you, you know, temporal data, hierarchical data, there's a growing understanding of the kind of questions that people want to ask, and the tools are gravitating towards answering those. Some of them are low-level tasks, like I want to compare this week to last week. I want to compare this patient to that patient, those kind of straightforward comparisons. Some of them find, I want to find the large or the small, the, the you know, outliers of different kinds. Others want to find clusters of different kinds. But I, I, I would say also there's a whole set of data quality control things. I'm looking for missing data. How do you look for missing data? I'm looking for duplicate data. I'm looking for incorrect data, OK? So anomalies, outliers, all those things are, are possible. And let me just make one other point. Your question brings me back to a central belief. We want to integrate statistical methods and visualization. This is not to replace one of the, we need both. We need both methods. Uh, what I see now as the main problem is so much attention to statistical methods, building a model, running a machine learning, doing statistics, doing correlations blindly, OK? And you could drive with your eyes closed, but it's probably safer to drive with your eyes open. And doing statistics without visualization is like closing your eyes. So open your eyes, look at the data. OK? And I would like to, you know, I've been playfully saying I'd like to make it illegal or at least unethical to do statistics without visualization. And that will lead us, the visualization, I believe, helps lead us down the way to asking better questions. I saw another hand. Yes, up front. Um, uh, applications in the world of law enforcement are obvious and Um, we had a cybersecurity one, uh, but we, I, I think you're right. A crime scene investigation, modus operandi, you know, if you had a good database in this format uh, that would allow you to look at uh, sets of crimes of a certain type and see if the same uh, MOU. Uh, the, the pattern of a, of a criminal career. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yes, I agree. No, we haven't had that. Uh, actually, Aaron Margolis, somebody from the FBI was going to come to this talk. Is he here? <laughs> so yeah, there was a contact about these things. Right? <laughs> or he's not going to tell us, right? <laughs> Other question, one more question I saw. Yes? When you visited the Smithsonian, you see the nuance in the astrophysicist, the astronomy, the challenges, well, it was interesting. We had a little bit of that discussion. I thought the, the one, the one I, I thought of while I was talking with them was about if you had a thousand galaxies of a certain type and there were events in the history of the galaxy, uh, then you might be able to notice the pattern of events that for one group of galaxies as opposed to another. But it sounds like that didn't work. 
Oh, that works. <laughs> that would work. All right. So I think, but you have to change your mindset from time series to think about events and to think that the questions have to do with the temporal diversity of events and the relative sequence of events. So that's kind of a new thing. So it does take a little while to wrap your brain around it. My favorite moment was one of the physicians we were working at with, with said, your tool gave me a new language for thinking about my problems. And yes, so new ways of thinking take a while. Thank you for your time and attention. I'll be glad to answer questions up front.